The next application that uh, we were we are going to look at is a diffuser. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the diffuser is an exact opposite of a nozzle. So, in a nozzle basically the high enthalpy of the fluid at the inlet is converted to kinetic energy of the fluid at the exit ok or in the enthalpy change across the nozzle is converted to an increase in kinetic energy ok. Now, in the case of the diffuser the uh, velocity of the fluid as it enters the diffuser usually is very high ok. So, V is high. So, what we would like to do is convert this momentum into uh, static pressure or pressure of the uh, fluid at the exit of the diffuser ok. So, uh, we would like the pressure to be high at the exit of the diffuser. Notice that normally uh, fluid will not uh, flow from low pressure to high pressure. In this case because the velocity at the inlet is high we are forcing it to uh, flow through the diffuser where the pressure at the exit is higher and that is possible because the momentum of the fluid is being converted to pressure. So, the fluid decelerates as it flows through the uh, as it flows through the diffuser <coughs> ok. So, here um, you can say that the velocity of the fluid at the inlet high velocity is converted to pressure at the exit of the diffuser or you can say the kinetic energy of the fluid is converted to an increase in enthalpy. Remember enthalpy of a fluid is U plus P V. So, uh, if the pressure increases for an ideal gas for instance if the pressure increases then um, other quantities also increase commensurately. So, the enthalpy increases. So, uh, the kinetic energy is converted to enthalpy in the case of a compressible fluid, but a more practical way of looking at it is to say that the high velocity is converted to the high momentum of the fluid is converted to uh, high pressure. So, what this basically allows you to do is that you know you can actually compress a fluid by a finite amount without using a compressor ok. Normally in order to compress a fluid we may use a compressor right we have to use a compressor. Now, in this case we have managed to achieve compression of a fluid without a compressor without any moving parts simply by utilizing the momentum the high momentum of the incoming fluid. For this to work the important thing is that the velocity at the inlet should be very high or the momentum at the inlet should be very high ok. Now, this is practically used in uh, in the case of supersonic uh, uh, missiles and supersonic aircraft uh, such as the Concorde or the SR 71 or any other fighter aircraft they all have intakes where the air in a frame of reference where the aircraft is stationary the air seems to approach the intake at a supersonic speed which is very very high. So, this may be utilized to compress the, uh, the air at the end of the diffuser or inlet inlet or intake as it is called ok. Since the compression is achieved without any moving parts it can actually be result in a lot of weight saving uh, for the engine itself ok. So, it is very extensively used in the intake of engines uh, of, of aircrafts and missiles that normally fly at supersonic speeds ok. Let us uh, uh, work out an example involving a diffuser. So, while cruising at an altitude of 24,000 meters and flight speed of uh, 972 meter per second, which is uh, 3.2 times the local speed of sound. Notice that normal aircraft, a commercial aircraft would usually fly at an altitude of uh, 10,000 meters. So, this is about two and a half times that much ok, 10,000 meters or about uh, 33,000 uh, feet. So, 24,000 meters works out roughly to about to an altitude of about 100,000 feet ok. So, the SR 71 uh, cruises at this uh, altitude and this speed which uh, just out of interest is 3.2 times the local speed of sound ok. Uh, so, the diffuser in the engine captures the outside ambient air which is at a pressure of 2.55 kilo Pascal which as you can imagine is uh, very small and a temperature of minus 51 degree Celsius. So, we wish to accomplish a pressure ratio of 39 that means the pressure at the exit of the diffuser divided by the pressure at the inlet is 39 ok. So, we assume steady state operation neglect PE changes and any heat loss and we are asked to calculate the final temperature assuming that the compression process obeys PV raised to constant and also the final speed of the air as it comes out of the diffuser.
So, for air uh, we know uh, gamma to be 7, 7 fifths and uh, Cp to be 1010.38 joule per kg Kelvin. Since uh, the process obeys PV raised to gamma equal to constant, we can easily evaluate the temperature to be uh, at the exit to be 632 Kelvin. So, the temperature goes from minus 51 degrees uh, Celsius to something like this. So, we apply SFE uh, to the control volume that was uh, shown in the illustration. And if you use the fact that for an ideal gas H is equal to Cp times right H equal to Cp times T, we can uh, simplify this expression and then arrive at this and calculate the exit velocity of the air to be 341 meter per second. So, uh, the air has been decelerated from a speed of uh, 972 meter per second to a speed of uh, 341 meter per second, approximately one thirds in order to achieve a compression ratio of 39. Notice that a compression ratio of 39 is quite high. Typically, the sort of compression ratio that is achieved in uh, using a compressor in an aircraft engine, ok. It is a very high uh, compression ratio. This illustrates that by decelerating the air, we can uh, actually accomplish compression like this. But in an actual uh, in an actual uh, uh, SR-71 engine, uh, of course, you know, we cannot, this is an ideal situation, the compression um, is not accomplished exactly in the same manner because uh, this sort of compression uh, is difficult to accomplish. You require a very long uh, diffuser which adds to the weight of the uh, engine. So, it is done slightly differently, but the basic idea is the same that uh, the high momentum of the intake air or air coming into the engine is uh, converted to uh, pressure rise uh, across the diffuser. So, the next uh, application that we look at is that of a mixing chamber. So, basically a mixing chamber as the name suggests mixes uh, different streams and uh, sends out uh, perhaps one or two streams at the exit. It may take two streams or more than that at the inlet and send out one or maybe more than that at the exit. So, here we have a, um, we have a mixing chamber where uh, steam at 10 bar 460 degree Celsius which is superheated comes in. And we also have liquid water at 45 uh, degree Celsius and 10 bar. These are mixed together and uh, what we want from the mixing chamber, what we want to do is adjust the mass flow rates of these two so that we have saturated liquid at 10 bar exiting the mixing chamber. <laughs> that is the design requirement. So, we neglect Ke and Pe changes, assume steady operation and uh, note that this is also insulated. So, Q dot is equal to 0. <coughs> So, if we try to uh, uh, show the states on a PV diagram, <coughs> let us go to the uh, pressure table. So, corresponding to 10 bar, the uh, you can see that corresponding to 10 bar, the um, uh, saturation temperature is about 80 degrees Celsius. So, let us say this is uh, 10 bar. So, the uh, saturation temperature is 80 degree Celsius. Let us uh, show the isotherm using a different color. I am sorry, this is uh, 180 degree Celsius. Uh, I am sorry. So, this is 180 degree Celsius. So, 10 bar 460 degree Celsius, uh, the state at 1 will then lie uh, here. So, this is state 1, that is a superheated state because this temperature is higher than the saturation temperature corresponding to 10 bar. And this one is a compressed or subcooled liquid because this temperature is less than the saturation temperature corresponding to 10 bar. So, that means state 2 will lie here and state 3 is saturated liquid at 10 bar. So, these are the states of the incoming, uh, incoming and exiting streams. Okay, so, if you apply SFE to the control volume that is shown, all the velocity terms and the elevation terms drop out because we have been told that uh, they are negligible. 
q dot is also equal to 0 because it is insulated the mixing chamber is insulated obviously there is no work interaction so w x dot is also 0 ok. One uh, thing that you must remember when we say that uh, work interaction is 0 is that we mean that w x dot is 0 uh, in the steady flow energy equation flow work has already been accounted for in the enthalpy term. So, this is um, this is a doubt that uh, students have all the time ok. Whether we have when I say uh, w x dot equal to 0 it means w x dot equal to 0. Remember flow work also has to be accounted for and that has been accounted for in the enthalpy term ok. So, if you rearrange this we get the ratio of the incoming mass flow rates m dot 1 over m dot 2 to be equal to this. H1 is a superheated state, so we can directly retrieve the value from the property table. No, uh, no difficulties there. But uh, H2 is a compressed liquid state, and if you go back and um, uh, review the um, uh, the approximation procedure that we laid out for calculating enthalpy of uh, uh, compressed liquid, you will realize that H is equal to U plus PV. So, H2 is equal to U2 plus uh, P2 V2 and we approximated U2 at this pressure and temperature as Uf at uh, 45 degree Celsius plus P2 times V2 is nothing but Vf at 45 degree Celsius ok. So, that comes out to be 189.42 and H3 is saturated liquid at 10 bar. So, that is uh, H3 is equal to uh, HF at 10 bar. So, we get the required ratio to be 0 0.2181. The next uh, application that uh, we are going to look at is um, uh, a throttling application. Um, uh, throttling literally uh, indicates what it means you know that a fluid is throttled. So, that it goes from a state 1 to state 2 without with very little change in velocity. So, in general application this is what is intended uh, uh, V 2 is approximately the same as uh, V 1. We will look at the conditions under which this is satisfied as we uh, go along. As a result of which we get H 2 to be approximately equal to H 1. So, what we wish to accomplish is an ice enthalpic process, but a change in state. So, we usually go from uh, high pressure and high temperature to a low pressure, low temperature fluid. So, the, just the state alone changes with all other uh, things remaining the same. <laughs> so, normally this is accomplished by making the fluid go through a very tortuous passage uh, like for example, in a porous plug which is indicated here or alternatively we may also use a valve which is partially open. So, that there is a uh, steep reduction in pressure and also a reduction in temperature <laughs> or in practical applications a capillary tube which is a very uh, uh, which is a long tube or of required length, but very very small diameter ok. That may also be used for this uh, purpose ok. Throttling is quite uh, extensively employed in uh, refrigerators and domestic air conditioners because uh, we want to achieve this change of state in as little distance as possible with as little added weight as possible ok. So, uh, capillary tubes are actually quite good. Porous plug uh, uh, may get uh, clogged with, uh, with time. So, the capillary tube is easier to replace and easy to service. So, capillary tubes are quite extensively used in uh, domestic refrigerators and air conditioners ok. Now, let us take a look and see uh, under what conditions we are able to use this. So, if we apply SFEE to this control volume, notice that the control volume is uh, shown like this quite far away from the porous plug. So, that there is, there is no, uh, so the fluid has sufficient time to attain equilibrium. So, this is an equilibrium state, this is also an equilibrium state. Uh, so, we if you apply um, uh, SFEE to this uh, assuming no heat loss, steady state operation, no Ke or Pe changes and obviously, there is no external work interaction. So, we get something like this. Now, if uh, states 1 and 2 are such that there is no significant change in the specific volume, then because the uh, area is constant, remember m dot is equal to uh, a 1 v 1 over v 1 or a 2 v 2 over v 2. 
since area is constant if v1 v2 is approximately the same as uh, v1 then the velocities will remain the same so now uh, we know that uh, if the states are such that there is no significant change in specific volume then v2 is approximately equal to v1 and it follows then from this equation that h2 is equal to h1 so throttling process is an isenthalpic process if and only if the change in specific volume is small otherwise the, there is there will be a change in the exit velocity because of the change in specific volume because the fluid expands as the pressure drops the fluid expands if the expansion of the fluid is significant then uh, v2 will be substantially different from v1 and the process will no longer be isenthalpic the analysis can still be carried out using this equation but the process will no longer be isenthalpic okay so uh, here we have saturated liquid r134a at 30 degree celsius it's a throttle to 200 kilo pascal in a domestic refrigerator heat loss to the ambient uh, is, a, is 2 kilowatt per unit mass flow rate of refrigerant we are asked to determine the final temperature and dryness fraction if saturated of the refrigerant uh, ke and pe changes may be neglected okay so, let us uh, see what the initial pressure is just to get an idea of how much uh, pressure drop uh, is being uh, accomplished in this uh, particular uh, throttling valve. So, we go to for that purpose we go to the, uh, the temperature table and look at the saturation pressure corresponding to 30 degree Celsius. So, let us go to the temperature table for R134A. So, corresponding to 30 degree Celsius which is so, the saturation pressure is 770.60 kilo Pascal. So, the pressure drop across this throttling valve is from 770, 770 to 200 kilo Pascal or 500 about a 570 kilo Pascal drop which is actually uh, quite high. Okay. So, uh, the specific enthalpy uh, may be retrieved from the uh, temperature table as 93.58 because it is saturated liquid. So, this is equal to HF at 30 degree Celsius. So, we apply SFEE uh, taking after taking into account uh, Q dot I am sorry this term should actually be Q dot over M dot. So, um, we calculate the exit enthalpy to be uh, notice that uh, q dot uh, goes in with a negative sign because it is heat loss from the device. So, the exit enthalpy is 91.58. Now, corresponding to 200 kilo Pascal, we have HF as 38.41, HG as uh, 244.5. Since H2 lies between HF and HG, exit state after throttling is a saturated mixture. So, the final temperature is the saturation temperature corresponding to 200 kilo Pascal which is minus 10 degree Celsius. So, the temperature drops from 30 degree Celsius to minus 10 degree Celsius. So, the pressure drops from 770 kilo Pascal to 200 kilo Pascal, temperature drops from 30 degree Celsius to minus 10 degree Celsius. So, that is the uh, function of a throttling valve. So, as we mentioned here high pressure, high temperature, low high pressure, high temperature to low pressure, low temperature. The temperature may not be high, it is high compared to this, but 30 degree Celsius is ambient temperature. So, it is high pressure and um, certain temperature to low pressure and low temperature and that is what we are accomplishing here. Okay. So, with the value of uh, known value of H2, we may calculate the dryness fraction at exit to be 0 0.258. Okay. So, if I uh, illustrate the process on a, on a PV diagram, okay, there is very little space here. So, let us try to manage. So, this is 770 kilo Pascal and this is 200 kilo Pascal. So, we go from saturated liquid at 770 kilo Pascal to, let me just uh, erase this a little bit. Okay, let us change the color. So, we go from saturated liquid at 770 kilo Pascal to a saturated mixture at 200 kilo Pascal with dryness fraction equal to 0 0.258. So, this uh, concludes our discussion of uh, devices in the first category that we mentioned here. Okay. 
We looked at nozzle, we looked at a diffuser, we looked at a mixing chamber, we also looked at a throttling process. What we will do next uh, is to look at examples from devices in the second category. So, in this um, lecture, we will um, uh, look at examples of uh, devices in the second category uh, for which uh, W x dot is uh, not equal to 0. So, W x dot is not equal to 0, but uh, for all intents and purposes, we still uh, assume uh, Q dot to be equal to 0. Okay. The first device that we will look at in this case is the turbine. Okay. Now, just like um, in a nozzle, uh, in a turbine also the pressure decreases across the turbine and the fluid undergoes an expansion process. But the similarity ends there. So, thermodynamically we may say that you know the pressure decreases across the turbine also and the working fluid undergoes an expansion process in the turbine uh, also uh, just as in the nozzle. But you may recall that in the case of the nozzle, So, in the case of the nozzle, uh, you may recall that uh, uh, m dot is equal to rho times a times the velocity v and um, uh, since uh, uh, the objective here is to convert the, um, uh, the enthalpy to kinetic energy, we force it to go through a, um, a narrowing passage or a passage of decreasing cross sectional area. When we do that, since the area decreases, the uh, velocity increases. Okay. Now, in the case of a compressible fluid, <coughs> since the fluid also undergoes an expansion process because the pressure decreases from inlet to exit, the density also decreases <coughs> which causes the velocity to uh, increase even more. So, this is how we accomplish the conversion of enthalpy to kinetic energy. So, by forcing it to go through a narrowing passage, we accomplish conversion of enthalpy to uh, kinetic energy. In the case of a compressible fluid for instance, the fluid naturally wants to expand because it is undergoing an expansion process, but by restraining it to go through a converging passage, we are actually uh, converting the enthalpy into kinetic energy of the fluid. Okay. Now, if we go back to the turbine, um, the thermodynamic process is the same, but the objectives are different. So, here also m dot uh, at any uh, cross section of the turbine. So, if I take any cross section uh, like this, m dot is equal to rho times a times v, where v is the axial velocity, that is the velocity with which the fluid is flowing uh, from inlet to exit. Now, in this case, the fluid is actually uh, undergoing an expansion process, which means the density is decreasing. But the objective here is to convert the enthalpy of the fluid into work. Okay? So, we allow the fluid to expand in this case, which uh, shows that the cross sectional area actually is allowed to increase to accommodate the expansion of the fluid. But the conversion of the enthalpy into work is accomplished in the blade passages in the turbine. So, the blade passages are shaped in such a way that the uh, enthalpy of the fluid may be converted to work while allowing the fluid to expand. Okay. So, turbines may be uh, designed in many different ways, but the simplest thing is as you can see the density decreases, we allow the uh, cross sectional area to increase to accommodate the expansion of the fluid. In contrast to the nozzle where the cross sectional area decreased and that was actually uh, uh, acting against the natural tendency of the fluid to expand. Okay. In this case, we allow the area to increase and accommodate the expansion. So, consequently this velocity in the case of a turbine is uh, usually a constant. Okay, so, that is how uh, these types of turbines are designed. This is called an axial turbine as the fluid flows axially along uh, from the inlet to the uh, exit. Okay. So, you can see how the uh, blade passage plays a key role in accomplishing the conversion of enthalpy to work in this case. Okay. So, when you later on take a course on turbo machines, you will be uh, taught how the blade passage uh, is designed to accomplish this effect. Okay. So, if you uh, uh, look at the, but such details are not necessary uh, in this course. But this gives an idea of how different devices accomplish different things. So, you can see here that uh, different uh, blades are shown, shown. So, we have shown a cross sectional area. So, these are uh, blades, let us just uh, change color here. So, these are blades which are fixed to the shaft as you can see. 
So, this uh, entire blade is in the circumferential direction. So, this is fixed to the shaft, this is fixed to the shaft, this is fixed to the shaft and this is fixed to the shaft. So, these are rotating blades. The blades which are in between them such as this one is fixed to the casing or the uh, wall <coughs> of the turbine and they are stationary. Okay. So, the fluid moves from a rotating blade to a through, a through a stationary blade through another rotating blade and so on. Okay. <coughs> so, as it moves through these uh, blades or blade passages, the uh, cross sectional area of the blade passage accomplishes the conversion of enthalpy to work in the case of a turbine. That is why um, the uh, turbine is illustrated schematically with an increasing cross sectional area as you can see here. Okay. Whereas, a nozzle you may recall uh, was illustrated schematically uh, using a decreasing cross sectional area. Okay. So, notice that for our purposes how exactly this uh, uh, conversion of enthalpy to work is accomplished is immaterial. So, which is why we have just shown a passage of increasing cross sectional area a shaft with uh, external work interaction W x dot which is positive in this case because it is a turbine. So, the inner details are unnecessary and this is our control volume. So, we apply the steady flow energy equation assuming steady flow, we can apply the steady flow energy equation to the turbine, um, eliminate terms that are uh, that are not relevant or, or equal to 0 and then proceed with the analysis. Okay. So, the thermodynamic process is the same in a nozzle and a turbine, the fluid undergoes an expansion process, but the objectives are different between the nozzle and the turbine. Okay, let us um, uh, look at a worked example involving a turbine. So, steam at 60 bar, in fact, uh, before we do that, uh, let us also take a look at, uh, uh, at a turbine, a picture of a turbine to see how. So, you can see that this portion is the turbine portion and you see how the cross sectional area of the turbine increases like this. So, you can see how the cross sectional area of the turbine blades increases like this. And in the case of the compressor, which is what we are going to look at next, we can see how the cross sectional area decreases. Okay. So, here you can see the increase in cross sectional area of the turbine as the fluid expands. And what are shown here are the rotating blades that I mentioned before. These are the blades which are fixed to the shaft and so they rotate. So, the stator blades, which are the stationary blades, uh, are located in between these rows of uh, rotating blades. They are not shown here for the sake of clarity. So, you can see how the uh, cross sectional area increases uh, axially as we move along the turbine. Okay, so, we now move on to a worked example uh, involving steam. So, steam at 60 bar 680 degree Celsius enters an insulated turbine. So, this means that q dot equal to 0 that is operating at steady state. So, we are allowed to use the steady flow energy equation. Uh, part of the steam is extracted from the turbine at 10 bar 460 degree Celsius. The rest is expanded completely and leaves at 45 degree Celsius and a dryness fraction of uh, 94 percent. Determine the power developed if the extracted mass flow rate is 17.9 percent of the total. Ke and Pe changes may be neglected. So, uh, we showed the control volume here. So, this is our control volume and we simplify the steady flow energy equation uh, applied to this uh, control volume with the q dot equal to 0 and ke pe changes neglected. So, we end up with an expression like this right and uh, so, at uh, inlet 1 which is uh, which would be this one in this uh, particular example in addition to inlet 1 and 2 we also have uh, I am sorry in addition to uh, inlet 1 and exit 2 we also have an additional uh, exit 3 where the steam is extracted. So, we uh, label this uh, exit as uh, 3. Okay. So, at um, uh, 1 uh, the steam is superheated at 60 bar and uh, 680 degree Celsius. The enthalpy values may be uh, retrieved from, uh, from the superheated table quite easily. At uh, exit 3, again uh, the steam is uh, superheated. So, the enthalpy at exit 3 may also be retrieved from the superheated table. Now, at exit uh, 2, uh, steam leaves at 45 degree Celsius and a dryness fraction of 0.94. So, we retrieve HF and HG from the temperature table and evaluate the enthalpy at exit 2 as 2438.67. 
So, the power developed by the turbine specific power that is per unit mass flow rate developed by the turbine uh, comes out to be 1236.95 kilojoule per kilogram. Notice that uh, the uh, mass flow rate of the extracted stream was given to be 17.9 percent of the total mass flow rate. So, since we have taken uh, m1 dot to be 1 kg per second, we take this to be 0 0.179 and this is the mass flow that is expanded completely and then this is the mass flow rate that is taken out at exit 3 itself. Now, in the absence of extraction, exit 3 will not be present. So, we go from uh, inlet 1 to exit 2 and the power developed per unit mass flow rate is simply H1 minus H2 and that comes out to be 1407.63 kilojoule per kilogram. Obviously, in the absence of extraction, the power produced is more. However, in many uh, power plants, some of the steam is usually extracted for other purposes. In fact, we saw uh, if you look at this, um, um, this particular case, this is coming out at 10 bar and 460 degree Celsius. Uh, so, the steam is extracted at 10 bar 460 degree Celsius and uh, you may recall um, uh, the mixing chamber example that we did where the steam came in at 10 bar 460 degree Celsius this is intentional. So, to demonstrate what is actually done with uh, extracted steam. So, although you lose some power when you extract steam from a turbine, that steam is usually used for heating um, other liquids and that is actually a very good way of um, uh, doing that. So, it is taken to a mixing chamber mixed with uh, compressed liquid like this, which then leaves at a high temperature as a saturated liquid. So, the steam can be used for other purposes. So, you lose some power, but you also gain uh, something else. Okay.